guys. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, this sermon is called A Cold and a Broken Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together and I thank you for what you're going to do today. Lord, I feel that this, every sermon is special in its own way, but I feel, Lord, that you are going to touch lives and change people's hearts through this sermon, oh God. I pray that that I will look back and just be marveled at how you, 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 your word through me to touch people's lives. Speak to me, speak through me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi guys, um, I got this sermon idea uh, listening to the song Hall Hallelujah by, um, originally done by Leonard Cohen, and Google said there were, there were over 80 versions of this song. Um, my favorite version is the, um, Ale Alexandra Burke version. She is... Uh, from England, she won uh, Britain's Got Talent in 2008, and this is one of her top songs. Um, and I love the wording. Uh, I love the wording of one of the verses. Um, it says, um, uh, it's a cold and broken hallelujah. And when I when I heard those words, the preacher in me kind of stood up. Because when we think of the term hallelujah, it's kind of like the highest praise to God. And although the song isn't a Christian song, necessarily well it has a christian backdrop but it it's not necessarily for christendom um cold and broken i mean like when i hear the words cold and broken together that seems like a negative thing when something's cold and broken is dark and dingy and not put together. It's shattered. It's obliterated. Um, and it doesn't really fit together. So I was like a cold and a broken hallelujah. And um, I just, and the song just loosely tells the story, not tells the story, but um, uses the backdrop of David, and I thought that was interesting. Uh, so, I thought, what a sermon, a cold and a broken hallelujah. So that is going to be my sermon today. Um, my sermon title today is called A Cold and Broken Hallelujah. Um, I, as I thought about the story of David, um, he's a man after God's own heart. He was the last son of Jesse. And Jesse, um, Jesse had a lot of sons. I think it was 12 or something like that. I could be wrong. And then David was not even counted um, in his sons when when they were picking a, another person to be a king um, because Saul really at that point uh, wasn't working out as a king um, he he just wasn't working out so they wanted to pick a new king to kind of uh, a, a successor for Saul. 
and David was the runt of the litter per se. He was he he herded the sheep. He was a shepherd. He was he liked to um play with his slingshot. He liked to just play in the field. And when when they came and lined up all of Jackie's sons, um, when, when it got to the last one, the person, I forgot what his name was, said, well, is there any more sons among you? And then his brother said, yeah, well, there's David, but he's small, and he's um, a shepherd boy, he's, he's this and that. And, and the person said, bring him here. And um, so he was anointed king. But from the time he was anointed, um, he was, he's, he was, like, really not considered to be anything. And I'm gonna break here for a moment and talk to all the would-be preachers who don't think they have anything to offer, like, or they may think they have a past that people won't listen to, or or they don't read well or in public, or they don't read the scriptures uh, fluently, or they don't, or something is wrong with them. But they they feel that something's wrong with them, but but they feel God is still in them to preach and they can't it's like a fire shut up in their bones as Jeremiah Jeremiah said and this could go for prophets to uh, preachers and teachers but there's someone under, under the sound of my voice you know God is calling you to preach and spread his word but you were, but you were so mired in the past, and you're like, um, I come from this. How could I be? How could I be a preacher when I have this struggle? Or how could I um, be me when I'm called to be with this? How, why would people listen to me when I struggle with this? Whatever the struggle is. Um, and the Lord says, He will use your struggle in your ministry. He will use your struggle in your ministry. So the thing that you think is a struggle, it's really something God is going to use in your ministry. Either He's going to use it to turn it around for his glory, or he's going to use it to tell people how, how you got delivered from it. And let me talk to you, preacher. You have something to say. You have something that is needed out there. Don't let the devil shut you up because you may have come from a single mom, or you may have been uh, be struggling with homosexual feelings, or you may be, whatever, struggling with lust, or whatever, or negative feelings about yourself, whatever you may be struggling with, the Lord is going to use your, your thorn to be the pinnacle of your ministry. Because, um, preachers hurt too, and Oftentimes, we, we as preachers, think that the thing that is
as kind of uh, stupid about us or strange about us is not the thing we try to hide because we just don't want people to know how we what we struggle but if people know where you struggle and how you struggle they will flock to you and I'm not saying you should always talk about how you you're struggling and whatever but cuz not ever people don't need to hear that all the time but if it's necessary for ministry speak on it brother but if it's just to say oh I struggle with this or whatever to get people to feel sorry for you or to get like um, fatigue about this thing and you're always talking about it for sympathy purposes that is wrong in that case brother sister you need to bring it to God and work through it but if it's for a ministry purpose go, go forth talk about it there's no need to be embarrassed about whatever you're feeling because there is always someone out there feeling the same thing so so if God is giving you something to speak about or a struggle that you're having can help somebody speak about it but I'm going to say before you speak about it make sure you keep make sure there's been enough time for the Lord to heal it there there is so many times when preachers go up to the pulpit and they go up hurt they go up broken they go up frustrated and they spew it out to their congregation not for ministry purposes or to help people the way um the way I said before but just to get it out um your pulpit is not a therapy session your pulpit is not for you to to spew out at this sister and this brother I, 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 I saw and heard about this nonsense growing up preachers spewing their hurt and their pain and their frustration on the pulpit and it's ridiculous brother sister you're called to be an oracle of God you are called you are called to say only what he tells you to say do what he tells you to do you are not called to, to spend your your own garbage on the pulpit it's not a garbage can the pulpit is supposed to be a place of healing a place of love a place of instruction it is not your personal garbage can if you have a personal issue with a person or or something you're dealing with go find a counselor go find a therapist go to the Lord in prayer we don't need to hear it on a Sunday morning okay so back to the, back to David um so after David gets anointed king um he he goes through a, a, a lot he goes through that whole thing with Bathsheba and that whole that whole situation with Bathsheba and Uriah and the whole um, uh, spying on Bathsheba in the shower, sleeping with her, getting her pregnant, uh, killing her husband to cover up his mistakes, and all of that. And then, oh, I forgot to say 
when David is anointed king, he 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 moves in with Saul, which is the current king, and Saul gets jealous of him and starts acting really strange, starts uh, throwing a javelin and trying to kill him and all this drama. All this drama can be found in first and second Samuel. So anyway, so there's the, the Bathsheba thing after that. After the Saul thing, there's the, the Bathsheba thing. And then David's friend Jonathan calls him out. And then in all of that drama with David, he is still called a man after God's own heart. He is still the best songwriter ever. We, we read his songs. They're called the Psalms. And most of the song, psalms, not all of them, but most of the majority of them were written by David himself. And the psalms are very interesting when you read them, because there are praise psalms, and then there are psalms that are so depressing, like, I said... So a psalm says, I, I wish that they would bash their children's head against a rock. And just very brutal. And some of, some of them says, praise the Lord. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. That's a psalm too. And, and then you have... His sons, David's sons, Absalom and Amnon, who just caused a whole bunch of trouble. One of the brothers rapes their own sister, Tamar, and then and then you have his other son, Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived. But then he couldn't control his lust with women and started to turn away from God and started to uh, uh, go to idols and start to do all this stuff. Although God gave him wisdom because he asked for it. And not only did he have wisdom, he had riches. So with all the from David to Absalom and Amnon and just right down to Solomon. The whole family. When I think of that whole family, I think of just being blessed and broken. Because on one hand, you have this family that seems to be so favored by God. Um, you have this family that is so into worship, and you have the father of this family who writes songs, like, that always says, um, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and oh, hallelujah, it's glory to God in the highest, and, and, but yet, the same person is sleeping with somebody's wife, getting her pregnant, lying about it, and killing, killing the husband. So, when I, when I, when I thought about the cold and broken hallelujah, I thought about, like, when your one side of you is saying, hallelujah, glory to God, but it's not in a happy way. It's cold and it's broken. It's like you're, ba like, have you ever been in times in your life where you're barely breathing, where you're barely getting up out of bed, and you're, and you're smiling 
over pain. You're not smiling through pain. You're smiling over it. Um, and you're saying hallelujah, but inside you're like, holy expletive. <laughs> and you're like, I can't. And you're like, oh, expletive. I can't take this anymore. And you're you're afraid to say hallelujah because you're just feeling so broken inside. Have you ever been in church and uh, the pastor's preaching or people are worshiping and lifting their hands and you are just trying to lift your hands but they just go down because you just feel so broken because of what's going on in your life. And the Lord says to those people today, I see you. And he says, even though it's broken, worship anyway. Even though it's a cold and it's a broken thing, even though he may not mean it, at the time, even though you may be mad at the Lord, even though you may be frustrated at the Lord, just, just surrender and worship. And he says, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But a cold and a broken hallelujah is what he, he says, it's what you need to free you. He says you've been silent for too long. You've been hurting for too long. And you need, beloved, to let that pain out. Even if it's cold and it's broken and you're frustrated and you're angry and you're sad and you don't know what to do. And you just feel so tired and you just feel so broken, and you've been broken for years. He said, even if that hallelujah is cold and it's broken, let it out. Let the pain out. Even, even if it's a guttural scream, let it out. Like, whatever it is, just let it out. And letting out that brokenness and that coldness, he said it will free you. You've been locked up in hurt for too long. You've been smiling over your pain for too long. He said it's time to release it. He said it, it, even if it's a even if it's an angry hallelujah, just release it. Like even if your worship that day is is not the thanks to God or whatever. Even if it's angry, do it angry, do it sad, do it frustrated, do it like, I don't know what the hell is going on, but I'm just gonna do it anyway. Like, um, in the church, we're, we're taught to shake off our pain and just worship the Lord and whatever. And yes, there is a place for that. But I'm coming to the conclusion that the Lord doesn't want me to shake off the pain and like pretend that everything's okay and say, God, you're still good. Which all that is true, by the way. But he wants me to bring my pain to him. And if I have to worship angry, I'll worship angry because what will happen if I worship angry? It will release the anger. It will release the hurt if I'm worshiping hurt. It will release the pain if I'm worshiping, uh, dealing with pain. And at the end of that release will be freedom. You bottling it up and you folding your hands is not helping. And you saying that, oh, 
oh yeah, this hurts, but God's been good. That's true, but that's not real for you. Yes, God has been good. We know this in theory. Yes, God has woken you up this morning, and there's always something to be thankful for. Yes, it's great to be thankful that you're alive. But this morning, God is saying to me, He wants your worship to be real. How you really feel. What you are really dealing with. And even if you do worship with angry feelings, at, at the end of that anger will be joy because then you would release what you need to relief, release. Too many people come to church or watch church online and do it angry, do it in pain, do it in stress. And they use church as a drug or they use worship music as a drug to forget about all their pain and stress. But the Lord doesn't want you to use it as a drug anymore. The Lord wants you to deal with it. Use worship as a catalyst to deal with it. To deal with your pain, to deal with your anger. You can you can worship like that because at the end of worship, at the end of you you um praying and seeking and worshiping you'll find joy, you'll find peace, you'll find gladness, you'll find love. And even if you're angry with God, even if you're hurt about the pain that's going on, going on don't pretend you're not. Use worship as, don't use worship as a um, as a cover-up to hide what's going on. Use it as a catalyst to drive you to deal with what's going on. I think this is, um, this is something that we've, we've totally misrepresented uh, in the church. We, we totally said, um, people come and shake off all your heavy bands. Shake off your tiredness and just worship the Lord. And then, what, my question is, what happens after that? What happens after I leave? Do I, do I pick up and deal with the same crap again? No, the Lord doesn't want you to just, like, like shake it up and smile and come in and scream and worship and, you know, pick up the same crap again. No, God wants you to deal with your pain, deal with your stress, deal with your kids that are driving you crazy, deal with your husband that cheated on you, deal with whatever you're dealing with. He, he doesn't want you to shake it off and pretend that everything's okay. Oh, hallelujah, let's worship together. I'm like, no, he doesn't want you to, do, he doesn't want you to do that. Honey, there's light at the end of this tunnel. Honey, you don't have to struggle like this. He doesn't want you to struggle. He wants you to have freedom. He wants to wants you he doesn't want church to just to just be a drug or a bad day like you took you take a sniff of cocaine and then high for a couple hours and that's what we've taught you in the church and I'm sorry we were we're we're humans and we're learning together but that is not not what God wants God wants to God wants the church to be a place of total and complete freedom and transformation. A place of just 
learning and healing and learning how to deal and learning how to grow. It just, it just has to change. And I'm sorry that we've done such a disservice to you. He, he wants freedom. He, he wants you to know right now that there is life. There is life. You don't have to deal with this pain anymore. You don't have to deal with this depression anymore. You don't have to deal with, with this alone anymore. He wants the church to be not a resource, but a catalyst to the source, which is Jesus Christ. And out of that, out of this source, comes the resources. Sometimes we go for resources first. We go for counseling first, and then that doesn't work. We go on medication if we need to, and that doesn't work. And all those things are necessary. But first, before we go for any resource, we have to go to the source, which is Jesus Christ. The Lord wants the church to be a place of complete healing and transformation. And not a place where you just hear a good word, take a few notes, you know, be in a, in a group, a cell group for, for an hour. He wants, a, he wants the church to be a place of learning, healing, and growing. And I just, I just sense this in my spirit. So, so I would say, um, praise broken. Praise when you feel dead inside. But praise if it's just hallelujah, hallelujah, or whatever. Whatever you feel, put that in your praise. Put that in your worship, and then when you do that, it will lift. It will lift, and and there will be true freedom, and there will be a, a way clear. And the Lord today wants you to know that your life is not over. Your life is not over. He has a plan for you. He loves you. He wants you to know how much you're adored and how much you're loved and how much he, he sees you. He knows what you're going through and he knows the brokenness. And if you have to bring him a call to the broken, hallelujah, do it. If you have to praise when you're broken, do it. If you have to say hallelujah when you're cold, do it. When everything feels numb and dead inside, do it. Because your praise will bring life. You, may, you might start praising broken, but then as you praise, it will begin to, you'll begin to feel whole. And the Lord wants your broken place praise to turn into a whole, a whole praise and a, and a worship of freedom. And he just wants me to say how much he loves you today, how much he sees you today, how much he thinks you're awesome today. And Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you are doing. God, you are awesome and worthy to be praised, God. We worship you. We praise you. We give you, we give you all of us. We don't hold back, Lord God. We surrender our brokenness. We surrender our coldness. We praise out of those places so that you can free us. Not, not so that we can stay there, but we know that praising brings freedom. Um, Lord God, I pray that you will just restore, heal, deliver us today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I will post I will post the whole story of I will post uh, in a previous in in another video where you can find the story of David Absalom and Amnon and his son Solomon and all that stuff. It's a really interesting story if you can if you have time to read it. Um, just to see how a family could be, um, how could, how a family could be broken and blessed at the same time. How a person could be called a man after God's own heart. And one of the, the key psalmists in the Bible, and then have so many issues with women and his children and um, just everything. I just want to say thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next week. Bye. And I will also post uh, that version of Hallelujah by, by Alexander Burt, too. I'll see you later, YouTube. Bye. Hallelujah, hallelujah.